This is the second in a set of videos on definitive screening designs. Before watching this video, you should have watched the first video on uh, DSDs, and you should have read the notes on definitive screening designs, and you may want to review the uh, screening design notes uh, three and four on the analysis of screening designs. So in this video, we are going to focus on how to analyze these definitive screening designs. And we're going to use an actual case study. And this comes from a biomanufacturing process where they are developing a way to produce a therapeutic protein. And the proteins are produced by genetically modified E. coli, fairly common procedure. And there were six factors that we were interested in studying, so a six-factor definitive screening design was used, and this was actually the first published case study uh, using a definitive screening design with some people that I worked with on a project. So this is the design. Notice there are four center points. One of them is required um, when you generate a, a definitive screening design. The other three were added for replication. Okay. So there are six factors. And let me explain uh, the concept of the experiment. The E. coli produce these proteins, and then the proteins are um, <clears throat> given shape by the actions of various enzymes. And then once they have been produced, the uh, cells, the E. coli cells, are sometimes called lysed or broken open. And the protein is extracted. So we're in the extraction phase of the uh, process. But one of the issues that occurs is that sometimes the proteins have a habit of linking to themselves or cross-linking with other proteins. Once they do that, they have the incorrect shape to be uh, functional as a therapeutic. Therefore, in the extraction process, the experiment is trying to find conditions to limit the amount of intra and inter cross-linking. And the factors are the protein concentration, the lysine concentration, duration of the extraction reactions, pH of the extraction solution, and then finally, uh, a formaldehyde to target protein ratio. So the formaldehyde is being used um, as a formulation um, method, and that is we're going to try to block the cross-linking sites, and then later we can remove the blockers, and then once the proteins are stable. But initially, formaldehyde is being used to inhibit cross-linking, and the response is extent of polymerization, basically the extent of cross-linking. Okay. So basically, I'm going to go over to jump, and I'm going to work through the analysis and we're basically going to use the same approach that we've used previously as, again, in analyzing screening designs. And I'm going to focus on all possible models. So I'm not going to go through every single step, but I'm going to walk through the steps that one goes through. And we'll pick a few models and see how they perform. So we go to the Analyze menu. Fit model, highlight the six factors. Now, since the definitive screening designs allow the estimation of both two way interactions and quadratic effects, the largest possible model I can define is a full quadratic model. And if you go under the macros button in the fit model window and select response surface, this is the full quadratic model. Okay. Well, this model has far more terms than I can estimate. But again, we are really counting on effect sparsity 
to eliminate a lot of these effects. So I'm going up after I add extent of polymerization. I'm going to go to standard least squares and go to the stepwise platform that we've previously covered. So go to stepwise. And then under the main report menu in stepwise, I'm going to select all possible models. And where it says maximum size of the model, for this particular design, the maximum size is 9. Okay, Take the number of unique settings, 13, and 13, and 13 minus 3 is 10. So the number of factors always the, in the largest models always has to be less than n minus 3, where n is the number of unique factors. And at this point, I'm going to just, uh, where it says number of best models, that's really up to you. I'm just going to pick 10. Click OK. Yes, we can fit that many models very easily. So Jump is now crunching through thousands and thousands of models and will output the best models of each size. So this is our all possible models output. I'm going to put the cursor in the middle of it, right click, and I'm going to sort by AIC in ascending order. So notice the AIC statistic seems to be zeroing in on models in the range of six to eight terms. Okay. So as I've shown previously, my next step is I'm going to output the all possible models table so I can do more processing. Um, and I can't really do it unless I make it into a separate data table. So I'm going to right click, make into data table. And then I'm going to add a couple of columns. Remember, in the screening design notes, I mentioned that often, instead of working directly with ARC or BIC, we work with the delta version of them. So I'm going to create the formula. So I created the column. Right click. Go to Formula. This takes us to the Formula Editor. Select AIC minus, and then scroll down to the statistical function group and select column minimum. And the minimum is AIC. Remember what delta is. It's the difference in of every one of the model AICs to the smallest overall. So in theory, the smallest AIC model is best. But again, there's considerable uncertainty in the estimate of these AIC values. So we like to work with the idea of these, excuse me, <clears throat> these delta values. And similarly, I will do the same thing for BIC, a similar concept. So again, I create the column, right click in the column header. Select formula. So I select BIC minus, and again under our statistical functions, I select column minimum BIC. Okay. So, by the way, notice something interesting. The AIC model has eight terms, and the best. BIC model has nine. So basically, they're actually coming very close to agreement. Okay. So what do we do at this point? Well, one thing I like to do is to visualize how these delta uh, AIC and BIC values change over the different model sizes. So I go to the Graph menu, select Graph Builder. The x-axis is number, or model size. 
then I'm going to highlight my two delta values and drag them over. Okay. And what I want to do at this point, I'm going to right click right on the Y axis and I'm going to move the BIC to the right just to make things a little easier to interpret. Okay. So notice that one of these models really stands out the AIC model but I'm also going to give some consideration to the BIC model. So my strategy at this point would be to pick a range of model sizes and we notice that there's a six term, seven term, an eight term, and nine term model that I'm going to select. Okay. So if I want to I can select them right from here to speed the process up. So I'm going to select the six term model with the lowest AIC, okay. the seven term model, the eight term model, and then I'm also going to select the um, BIC model that is smallest. Okay. And I'm not going to save the script for this. So again, I might do more modeling under other circumstances, but for right now, I've picked a six term, seven term, eight term, and nine term model. And I want to fit these models, so I'm going to go back to my all possible models output, which is still open. And to facilitate model fitting, I'm going to just right click and I'm going to remove the model column. That just makes it easier to work with the output. And then what I'll do at this point is start fitting the model. So I'm going to start with the six term model. Okay. So the six term model is basically right here. So remember once we define a model it's uh, the model is uh, selected in the current estimates window. Run the model, okay, and this opens a uh, fit group. So now I'm going to go back to my all possible models output, and the next model that we're going to select is a seven term model. So we'll just scroll back down. So I'm going to look for the biggest seven term model. And there it is. Select run model. Now that has been added to the fit group. Okay. And then we'll follow the same procedure. I'm then going to fit the eight term model. Okay. Add, click run model to add that to the fit group. And then finally, I'm going to add the um, BIC model with nine terms. Okay, so at this point, I really no longer need the all possible models output. Again, you doing this uh, as uh, an ex a modeling exercise or as a project would spend more time, but at, for a video, I'm just working through the details. Okay, So at this point, we now have a fit group. Okay. And in this fit group, a number of things I want to do uh, have displayed in all the reports. So I'm going to hold down my control key, go to one of the report menus. So I'll just pick the first one. Under row diagnostics, I want to see the actual by predicted plots. Again, hold down the control key. And I want to see under row diagnostics the press statistic. And then finally, I'm going to hold down the control key. And under regression reports, I'd like to take a look at the AIC and BIC values. So remember, our models start from smallest to best, okay. and typically smaller press values are desired, meaning 
there is smaller prediction error. So there's the six-term model. Okay. By the way, in these displays, I'm not really seeing any evidence of lack of fit, which we could test for since we have center points, but there doesn't really seem to be any to, that would concern me. Okay. So now we can scroll down and take a look at the seven-term model. Okay. Press is a little smaller. Again, there's no evidence that the uh, of significant lack of fit. And then we scroll down to the eight-term model. Okay. Notice the press is a little smaller. And then finally, our biggest model in this one is, is approaching being overfit because of its size. Okay. Scroll down, and again, it's the smallest press. However, um, it may be overfit. But in any case, what I'm going to do at this point, okay, I've fit all these models. I'm going to hold down um, the control key. I'm going to go to response, uh, the main response menu, so response extent polymerization, and under save columns, save prediction formula. I strongly recommend under the fit group menu, once you've gotten the entire fit group report the way you want it, you save it to the data table. I've already done this, so I'm not going to go ahead and do it. And then I'm going to close. Um, out my fit group, but again I've saved the script so I can rerun it. Now, what I want to do next, I want to compare all these models of fit to see if some may perform better than others. So go to Analyze, Modeling, Model Comparison, where you can compare the various models you fit to see how they perform. So all I do is put in my four models, click OK, and what I like to do is sort them okay, um, ascending by the root average squared error. This is the standard deviation of the prediction. Okay. And notice it really seems to like the biggest model, although it may be overfit. One thing we can do, we don't necessarily have to use one model. One thing I could do is, it's called model averaging. So what Jump did, it created a new model where the prediction, and we call this prediction averaging, is just the average of the four models. One reason to do this is it could reduce any potential effects of overfitting. At this point, I want to evaluate the process and use the profiler for optimization. So I'm going to go to the graph menu and go down and select profiler. And I'm going to use my averaged model. Very important, down in the lower left-hand corner, select Expand Intermediate Formulas. This will give me the profiler in the original variables. Okay. So there is my model. Okay. I can then use Desirability. And by the way, we want to minimize polymerization, so I'm going to minimize. Then do maximize and remember for desirability. Okay. So notice, by the way, it's giving us a negative value. And why, why it's doing that, the lower bound is zero, but I have not put any constraints on the problem. But what it is telling you is um, you get the smallest possible um, polymerization running at the low settings of these variables. 
And then finally, something I like to do under the prediction profiler, it says assess variable importance. What it's doing is studying which variables are most important. For those of you who may run processes someday, this is actually valuable uh, output. So what it's showing you, basically the three biggest inputs are the protein concentration, formaldehyde protein ratio, and temperature, and potentially quadratic effects and interactions. So these three variables you would want to be sure were tightly controlled. Okay, and I wanted to show you one other approach that we talk about briefly in the definitive screening design notes. So I'm going to go back to fit model, hit recall, and go back to the stepwise platform. And in the report menu, instead of all possible models, I'm going to pick model averaging. Okay. This is a fairly new but interesting approach. What it does, it does all possible models, but for every single term in the full quadratic model, it gathers together the estimates of that effect across all the models where that effect occurs and then takes a weighted average. Yes, it's okay. I'm going to fit them. Okay, this is a really fascinating concept that, again, is now available to us because we have computers and software that can do it for us. So there, using model averaging, is a, what we would call the model averaged um, model. This is not prediction averaging. Here we're averaging to get the coefficient estimates. So I'm going to save the prediction formula. And once again, let's go back under Analyze, Fit uh, Modeling, Model Comparison. And this time, we'll add in our model averaging term. model comparison. And again, I'm going to sort the output by RAC ascending, smaller means smaller prediction error. Okay. So notice the model comparison average, and then we have the prediction uh, the different prediction formulas. Still, that largest model does better, but again, be careful of overfitting. It may not predict well on new data. Then we have the average predictor, and then we have model averaging. So in terms of the protecting against overfitting, these two may be your best choices, and frankly, they do quite well uh, compared to the other models. So basically, this is the approach I'm asking you to use in a homework assignment to analyze a definitive screening design. Use model averaging, use all possible models, and do prediction averaging. And by the way, if you want to create definitive screening designs, they're done in the DOE menu under definitive screening. And you can say how many factors you want. And by the way, you can have nominal variables, but they can only have two levels. So you would go into this platform and create the design.